let's start with the circulation of the cerebral system. We will see the arteries, we will see the veins of the brain, then we will see the arteries in the brain, the veins of the spinal cord. Everything will be covered, if not today, then we will finish by tomorrow. And then we will start with the clinical part of it. When we talk about the cerebral circulation, we divide into anterior and the posterior circulation. The anterior circulation is the inter carotid system, and the posterior circulation is the vertebral basilar system. And the two together unite at the circle of villus. So we will take them one by one. We we'll first start the anterior circulation. You see all the branches, all the relevant branches. You will see their supply. Then we we'll see the posterior circulation. We we'll do the same. Thing. So let's start with the anterior circulation. Anterior circulation means the internal carotid system. Parts of the internal carotid artery. Four parts. We are not so bothered about the first three parts, so we will just mention the names. Cervical part in the neck, not very important for us, except to remember that it has got a periarterial plexus. You can see the plexus in this picture here. This is the cervical part. Next part, inside the petrous temporal bone. Where is the skull? Where is the skull? <laughs> this is the petrous temporal bone here. So it enters like this. And you can see one opening here. It enters into the petrous canal. Therefore, you cannot see it. It is inside. This is the petrous part. It runs anteromedial in the petrous temporal bone. It runs over this cartilage. And there's a foramen here. That's called the foramen lacerum, which is the foramen lacerum. If you were to look closely, this is the foramen lacerum, where my pointer is pointing. Many people think that the artery goes through the foramen lacerum. No, it does not go through the foramen lacerum. It goes over the foramen lacerum, as you can see in that picture. Because the foramen lacerum in life is covered by a plate of cartilage. So it goes over the foramen lacerum. Once it goes over the foramen lacerum, now it has entered the cavernous sinus and it becomes the third part, the cavernous part. It runs in the cavernous part, we all know that it runs in many other structures and it runs from posterior to anterior in this portion. And as it runs, it forms a shallow groove on the side of the sphenoid bone, which is called the carotid groove. When it reaches the end of the cavernous sinus anteriorly, just under the anterior clinoid process, just under the anterior clinoid process, it makes a 180 degrees bend backwards. This 180 degree bend backwards is known as the carotid cycle. Please pay very close attention and I will tell you more about it as we go along. And this is the place where it pierces through the dura and arachnoid and it becomes the cerebral part. And the cerebral part is the one which then supplies the brain. So three parts, four parts. Cervical, petrous, cavernous, cerebral. As I go along, you'll find that throughout this chapter, I have mentioned certain things in blue. These are the clinically relevant parts. I won't be stressing them now because I'm going to talk about them tomorrow in great detail. But when you read, please pay very close attention to those structures marked in blue, those, pay, those paragraphs marked in blue. The carotid siphon is seen very clearly in radiological pictures. It will be seen as a bed like this. And this is a site of atherosclerosis. It is a site of aneurysm. And this is the aneurysm which compresses on the lateral part of the optic chiasma to produce which type of hemianopia? These answers should come out stat. It produces ipsilateral nasal hemianopia. And I'll show you the relationship as we go along. So this is the importance of this carotid sinus. Okay, so now we have reached the cerebral part. And now it divides into its two terminal divisions. ACA and MCA, and we shall see the branches of the cerebral part. That means after it has entered into the cranial cavity. Cerebral part, the branches of the cerebral part. The first and foremost branch, so this is the carotid side, when you can see there's a lateral view. This is an anterior posterior view. This is another picture to show you the cervical part, the petrous part, which you cannot see because it's inside the petrous bone. This is the cavernous part, and this is the carotid side. And you can see this anterior cranial process. So the carotid siphon is just inframedial to the anterior glenoid process. Are we absolutely clear? 
and once it is pierced through the duraragnoid, it has become the cerebral part here. Okay, branches of the cerebral part. The first branch, it runs just after the carotid cycle, and this is the only branch which runs anteriorly. When you get this type of picture, you should be able to pinpoint it. This ophthalmic branch. This enters through the optic canal into the orbit. And in the optic canal, it is accompanied by the CN2. And in the optic canal, it gives us the central retinal artery. For our purpose, that is the most important artery. And we have already seen the central retinal artery runs in the optic nerve and it supplies the neural layer of the retina. The story of the ophthalmic artery does not end there. The rest of the ophthalmic artery is just distributed to the structures inside the orbit. It's got many branches inside the orbit. And it also comes outside the orbit and continues up as the supraorbital artery, which you would have studied in your anatomy. So that is the rest of the ophthalmic artery. But we are not bothered about that. I just wanted to tell you something very interesting. This is the only branch of the internal carotid which goes outside the orbit, which goes outside the skull. That is the supraorbital branch. Otherwise, all the other branches are inside the brain. That's just for your interest. So the first branch is the ophthalmic artery. And we shall see many clinical correlations of this ophthalmic branch. We'll see tomorrow. Second branch. Take a very good look at this structure here. This is a section of the brain seen from the inferior aspect. And I've shown you this picture several times. This is optic chiasma here. And you can see the cut section of the internal carotid here. Second branch which comes out is the posterior communicating artery. This runs just above CN3 in the base of the skull, in the base of the brain, sorry. It runs in the base of the brain here. And it communicates with the PCA. That's why it is called the posterior communicating artery. So it runs in close proximity to CN3. This is the most common, second most common site of aneurysm in the circle of Willis. And when it enlarges, it can produce CN3 compression. Again, it's mentioned there. Third branch. You can see very clearly here. And all of you know this branch. What is the name of that branch? Anterior choroidal branch. It runs just below the optic tract. It runs almost parallel and inferior to the optic tract. So therefore, it supplies the optic tract. It supplies the LGB on the thalamus, it also supplies a little bit of the internal capsule, and it supplies, please take a good hard look at this, it supplies the choroid plexus of the lateral ventricle. So this is the supply of the optic of this choroidal branch, and we have already seen some clinical correlations. Can anybody name that clinical correlation for me? Occlusion of the anterior choroidal artery produces something called Monaco syndrome, where you have contralateral homonymous hemianopia because of loss of blood supply to the optic tract, as well as you can see the LGB here. This is the lateral geniculate body, this is the medial geniculate body. You can see that. And it also supplies. So therefore, this portion, this anterior choroidal artery has got two segments. A portion which supplies the choroid plexus, that is known as the plexal segment, and a portion which is running in the cistern, that is known as the cisternal segment, that is the interpedicular cistern. So this is the third branch. And finally, the rest of the internal carotid divides into its two terminal branches, a small ACA and a big MCA. Now we shall take these one by one. The ACA, the first one, the smaller one. The smaller of the two terminal divisions, it runs anteromedially, just above the optic nerve, just superior to the optic nerve, these are two optic nerves. It runs anteriorly and it enters the longitudinal fissure of the brain. The longitudinal fissure. The moment it enters the longitudinal fissure of the brain, it is joined by from the opposite side by a small communicating branch. Who will name that branch for me? This small communicating branch is the APOM, anterior communicating artery. And take a good hard look at the relationship of the APOM to the optic chiasma. This was a question in your block three. The ACOM is situated just superior to the optic chiasma in the upper part. It's a very small branch, but this is the most common site 
of aneurysm inside the circle of the nest. Second most common was FECOM. ACOM is the most common site. It is joined by the ACOM. Let's continue with the other branches of ACA, the course. So it is joined by ACOM just above the optic plasma here. The rest of the ACA then runs all around the corpus callosum. Most of the ACA runs around the corpus callosum like this. The portion of the ACA which is proximal to the ACOM, it is referred to as A1. And the portion of the ACA which is distal to the ACOM, that that is the rest of the ACA, is referred to as A2. And there are many other subdivisions, A3, A4. We are not bothered about the A3s and A4s. For our purpose, we will remember that the portion of the ACA proximal to the ACOM is called A1, and the portion distal to it is called A2. Why are we bothered about this subdivision? Can anybody hazard a guess? You will know about it tomorrow, but I would like you to think and answer me. The reason is, if there is any occlusion of the ACA proximal to the ACOM, there will be collateral circulation from the other side. There will be no ischemic manifestations. On the other hand, if there is an occlusion of the ACA distal to the ACOM, that is A2 onwards, you will get anterior cerebral artery occlusion symptoms. Make sense? That is the yes. Sorry, proximal and distal to each other? Exactly proximal that. means before the ACOM. That is, when the artery is flowing like this, this is proximal, that is distal. Oh, okay, good. So the portion this is proximal and this is distal. Make sense? So if the ACOM is somewhere here, this portion is proximal, this is distal. So just think of any structure which is flowing. The one upstream is called proximal. The one downstream is distal. So any occlusion before the ACOM is, there will be no symptoms because and if it's distal to the ACOM, then A2 onwards, there will be symptoms. That is the reason why we have subdivided ACOM into ACA into A1, A2. Continuing with the ACA, it continues over the genu, rostrum, and the genu, and the body of the corpus callosum till the anterior four fifths. These values are very important. And then it anastomoses with the branches of PCA, which we shall see a few slides later. So this is the course of ACA. Again, there's an important point here. When it is going over the corpus callosum like this, this curved portion, it is one of the very common sites of atherosclerosis. And we shall see tomorrow why so. This bone is written there in blue. This is the common site of atherosclerosis. This is another picture to show you the same thing. And it anastomoses somewhere here with the branches of PCA. So this is the course of the ACA. Now let's take the branches of ACA. When we talk about the branches, for all these ACA, ACAs, MCAs, and PCAs, we are going to talk about two sets of branches. One set of branches are called the cortical branches, and another set of branches are called the central branches. So we will not repeat them again and again. We will automatically take it for granted that all these cerebral arteries have both cortical branches and cerebral branches. Let me tell you what, the, what does it mean. Cortical branches means they supply the outer few millimeters, three to four millimeters of the gray matter, the cortex. That's why they call cortical branches. Central branches means they supply the deep subcortical structures, gray and white. So that's what the, that's the meaning of the central branches and versus cortical branches. So let's take the cortical branches of ACA first. I've written a few names there that are just for your amusement. Don't memorize those names. The important branches are the ones which are seen in this picture. And it's also shown in that picture. ACA supplies most of the medial surface of the cortex, the cortical branches. Therefore, it supplies the anti, the, almost the entire cingulate gyrus. It supplies the medial frontal gyrus. It supplies the barocentral lobule. Barocentral lobule, if you remember, is the indentation seen on the medial surface by the lateral sulcus, by the central sulcus of Rolando. It supplies up to the precuneus. It supplies the medial PFC. 
and it supplies the orbitofrontal PFC. Medial PFC is this surface, and orbitofrontal PFC is this surface. So these are the cortical branches it supplies. It does not go beyond the paradoxical circus, as you can see very clearly here. So remember, ACA is the artery for the leg area of the cortex. And all of us know that the medial surface of the cortex is concerned with the leg area. Of course, there are many other structures of this area. You shall see them in a couple of functional areas. Right at the beginning of the ACA, just after the ACOM, it gives us a small curving branch. You can see this one here. This has got a very important name and it's got a very important function. This is called the recurrent artery of Leuvner. This is also a cortical branch. It is also referred to as distal medial striate artery. What does it do? As the term implies, it is a recurrent artery. The rest of ACA is going in this direction. This is going in the reverse direction. That's why it's called the recurrent artery. It is also called the medial and striate. So look at these words. What does this one do? It's a small artery. It supplies the medial surface of the PHC. Both the sides, each. And it also supplies a little bit of the striate anterior part of the striate. That's why it's also referred to as distal medial striate artery. And this has got a very, very important unit of correlation which I shall not talk about now. Just note and look at that. So these are the supplies of the AC. It's an artery of the medial surface. However, what is not shown in this picture, but I'm going to show it in another picture, is that same ACA, it also supplies a little bit. Please look at this very closely. It supplies a one inch strip of the cortex on the supralateral surface also. So not only does it supply the medial surface, it extends a little bit onto the supralateral surface at the supralateral margin. That's an important point to note. I'll show you in another picture. So these are the cortical branches. And it's written there also. Coming to the central branches. The central branches are these branches here, you can see in this picture. These are referred to as the anteromedial central arteries because they are coming from the anteromedial part of the circle. Yes, but they are all branches of AC. These are very special branches. What do they do? They penetrate the surface of the cortex at right angles through an area of the cortex here shown which is called the anterior perforated substance. In fact, that area of the brain is called anterior perforated substance because it is perforated by these branches. Make sense? Anterior medial central arteries are the ones which penetrate through this area and this area and they enter into the substance. Now these arteries are heavy arteries. They are end arteries. They do not anastomose inside the substance of the brain. And these are sites of occlusion and produce a special type of infarction which are known as lacunar infarcts. Because they are end arteries, they do not anastomose and they have a lot of problems. We will talk about it tomorrow. So these are the anterior medial central arteries, which are the central branches. They are perforating arteries because they perforate. They perforate through the anterior perforate substance, and they are end arteries. They do not anastomose. What do they supply? They supply all the structures in the depths of the cortex, and which are they? We will mention a few of them. They supply the anterior part of the basal ganglia. They supply the anterior limb of the internal capsule, and they also supply, especially this, this branch, that this main artery that you see here, this is called the pericalosal branch. They supply the anterior forebends of the corpus callosum. So the central branches are the ones which supply these important structures which are required for us. Anterior forebends of the CC is supplied by ACA. Anterior limb of the inner capsule is supplied by ACA. And anterior part of the basic anterior is supplied by ACA. So these are the anterior medial perforating central arteries. And they perforate through the anterior perforating substance. Okay. Now let's come. So this is a summary slide of the ACA. And it pretty much recaps in brief in one slide what our I told you. The important point to be noted here is that it supplies the leg and the foot area of the body. Both sensory and motor. Anterior part is motor, the posterior part is sensory. All of us know that. And it also supplies the medial frontal gyrus. 
Medial frontal gyrus controls the urinary sphincters, if you remember. And of course, it supplies the medial PFC, it supplies the orbital frontal PFC. And of course, it supplies the anterior portions of the corpus callosum. Let's see. So, A, C, A, leg and foot area as well. That's a good mnemonic for you to remember. And we shall see the significance of the recurrent artery of Huebner a little later, maybe tomorrow. I won't talk about it now. I don't want to distract you. Now let's come to the larger of the terminal branches of AC, of the internal carotid, the MC. We have already seen the picture, the first picture, where the MCA ran like this. So the MCA, once it starts from the internal carotid, it runs naturally. Just for your recollection, let me show you this picture. Okay, you can see that this picture also. Can you see the MCA running laterally? So the MCA runs laterally, it runs in the lateral fissure. Why does it have to run in the lateral fissure? Because it has to run through the lateral fissure and it has to run from, from inside, it has to run through the lateral fissure, it has to come outside. That is why it runs through the lateral fissure and then what you're seeing here is after it has come outside through the lateral fissure. So it runs laterally through the lateral fissure and comes outside. So it comes out in the depths of the lateral fissure here. It comes out from here. Okay. In the depths of the lateral fissure, there are many things happening. It divides into two principal trunks, a superior trunk and an inferior trunk. Take a good hard look at that, because that is, again, a very common sign of atherosclerosis. The superior trunk comes out of the lateral fissure and it supplies the suprolateral surface of the cortex, from the lobe and parietal lobe. But we'll come to that later. The inferior trunk again comes up to the lateral fissure and supplies the infrolateral surface of the cortex, predominantly the temporal. So this is the course of the MCA. Now let's take a look at the branches. Again, same thing: cortical branches and cerebral branches. Cortical branches. It supplies the entire suprolateral surface of the cortex. As you can see in this picture and in this picture, you can see the artery coming out here. But it does not supply three areas. Yes? Sorry, just on that point, you said that the ICIA also does a one inch span. I'm coming to that now. Just bear with me. Yeah, what I'm saying. It supplies the entire supralateral surface of the cortex except three areas. One inch tip of the cortex here. Can you see? Because that is already supplied by ACA. Next, it does not supply the inferior temporal gyrus because we shall see that is supplied by the PC. And it does not supply the occipital lobe because that is also supplied by the PC. So the cortical branches supply the entire supralateral surface except these three areas. Yes. So on that point, do they ever converge or are those in the arteries that are present on? There's a very, your arteries are, I'll have to come to that about 15 slides later. Your, your question will be answered. Little later. So this is the supply, this is the distribution, dead radial cortical distribution of the MC regarding the conversion in the artery business. I'm going to come to that just a little later. So you can clearly see the distribution of the MC. So point to be carried home. MCA supplies the bulk of the functional areas of the cortex, which you have all studied, and I have reproduced them here for you. First, it supplies the both motor and sensory the face and the arm area, yes or no? MCA is the artery for the face and the arm area, both motor and sensor. It supplies the premotor cortex. It supplies the frontal eye field. It supplies the Broca's area. It supplies the verdicase area. It supplies the primary and the secondary auditory areas. So these are the important functional areas that we need to remember. I'm going to show the functional areas in the clinical picture tomorrow, but right now I'm mentioning them because we, you have to know them. Not forgetting, it also supplies the superior parietal lobule and the inferior parietal lobule of the parietal cortex. What it does not supply is, it does not supply the occipital lobe, which we have already mentioned. So it stops there, and it does not supply the inferior temporal gyrus. So this is the supply of 
the cortical supply of ACA. Please remember the functional areas. So therefore, Wernicke's aphasia, Broca's aphasia, frontal field, motor cortex of the arm, face, all the things, auditory cortex, lesions, everything that you studied are all MCA occlusion strokes. Make sense? So these are all the MCA areas. So MCA is the face and the arm area. We continue with our story. The central branches of MCA. As we have already agreed, central branches are those which penetrate into the cortical substance. They also do the same thing. Take a look at these branches. This is the course of the MC, as I told you, it is running laterally through this lateral fissure. If this is a coronal section of the brain, this is a coronal section of the brain. You can see the lateral fissure here. It runs like this and comes on the surface, and we have described this supply. We have described these supplies just now. Now I'm talking about the central branches. To show you the central branches in another location, let me take out a picture of, again, the, this one. Can you see the MC running here? Can you see these branches coming out, small, small branches? They are the same branches here. They are called the anterolateral central arteries. For the, for the ACA, they were called anteromedial central arteries, if you know. Here, they are called anterolateral central arteries. They are the penetrating end arteries. Let me get out of this picture and come to this. These are very important. In fact, they are so important that I can't even emphasize the importance of them. They are so important. They are called anterolateral central arteries. They are also referred to as lenticulostriate arteries. They are also called Charcot's arteries of cerebral hemorrhage. 90% of the strokes that you will see, and trust me, you will see, even whether you are a neurologist or a neurosurgeon or not, you will see, even in your general practice, are caused by these arteries. These, these are the anterolateral central branches we call them called the lenticulostriate arteries. What do they do? <laughs> there are two sets of these. There are many of them. There are hundreds and thousands of them, as you can see in these pictures. They are divided into a medial group and a lateral group. The medial group supplies the inner part of the corpus striatum and the basal ganglia. And the lateral group supplies the lateral part of the basal ganglia. So they have been, just for the sake of understanding, they have been divided into a medial group of striate arteries and a lateral group of striate arteries. The word striate means they supply the striatum, which is the major part of the basal ganglia. So they are all branches of anterolateral central arteries, also known as lenticulostriate arteries. They are all synonymous also known as Charcot's arteries of cerebral hemorrhage, and we are going to talk about this in great detail tomorrow. Okay, let's continue. These ones, they supply the bulk of the basal ganglia, the caudate nucleus, putamen, globus pallidus. And they also supply, please note down and write it down 100 times. They supply the genome of the corpus callosum and the posterior limb of the corpus callosum. They supply the genome and the posterior limb of the corpus callosum. In the temporal lobe, they also, the central branches also supply. Do we remember, do we remember a part of the optic radiation which formed a loop into the temporal lobe and then one went backwards? Did we give the name? The Myers loop, the media and the MCA branches, central branches also supply the Myers loop. Yes. Oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Yes. They supply the genome and the posterior limb of the internal yes. Thank you for correcting me. Yeah. You know, I sometimes, I get carried away with my own words. So then the genome <laughs> and the posterior limb of the internal gas. So these are the central branches. And you can see very clearly, we will come back to these branches with clinical correlations, and I've already alluded to it. I told you that they are known as the Charcot's arteries of cerebral hemorrhage. We will talk in detail about them tomorrow. So this is again a summary slide of the MCA pretty much details whatever we have mentioned. It supplies the base and the arm area of the cortex. It supplies most of the functional areas that we have studied in the cortex. It supplies the genome and the posterior limb of the internal capsule. And it supplies the part of the basal ganglia. I'm just taking you with a quick summary. This is also another picture to show you all the functional areas with the MCA distribution. Do remember that it does not supply these three strips of cortex. One here, one here, and one here. Again, another picture to show you the same thing, which I mentioned. The reason why I put so many pictures and all these things is so that 
you are absolutely clear, you have a clear picture in your mind. Yeah. And then trying to memorize things. So we are finished with the anterior circulation. What was the anterior circulation? Mm -hmm. The internal carotid and its branches. Yes. Right now. now let's come to the posterior circulation. What is the posterior circulation? The vertebral basal are system. Okay, so just for your recap again, this was the anterior circulation, which we finished. Now we are talking about the vertebral basal are system. We will break it up. We will first take the vertebral artery, then we will take the basal artery, and then we will see the branches. Vertebral artery. Again, four parts, respectively called V1, V2, V3, V4. We will not bother our heads over all the parts except the relevant salient points. The V1 is the cervical part. It runs in the neck. It runs through all the muscles of the neck and all this thing, go through the triangular space. Second, V2 part, the vertebral part. It runs through the transverse foramen of the cervical vertebrae. That's why it's referred to the vertebral part. And if you remember the, your anatomy of the cervical vertebrae, the transverse process have got small openings. They are called the transverse foramen or the foramen transverse area. So it goes through the transverse foramen of the cervical vertebrae, starting from the C6 upwards, C6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, not the C7. The C7 foramen transverse process either does not have a foramen or this foramen is very small. So it goes through 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, that's the vertebral part. Here, there's a very important thing. And you will see, may see, I'm not sure whether you will see or not, excessive vigorous cervical manipulation. Like sometimes it is done by chiropractitioners, practitioners, catch hold of the good head and do vigorous manipulation like that. No, I'm not going to do this. <laughs> She's worried I'm going to do this. Can produce rupture of the tunica intima of the vertebral arteries inside the vertebral transverse foramen. And when the tunica intima is ruptured, what happens? That goes into the tensa media and produces a condition which all of you know called split dissecting It is not a theoretical thing, it is a well documented dissecting aneurysm of the vertebral artery can occur from excessive vigorous manipulation of the cervical spine and it occurs in this segment. Good. Third segment, it goes to a small triangle at the base of the skull, which is called the subhospital triangle. It goes to a small triangle and then it penetrates the atlanto-hospital membrane and it becomes the cranial part. The cranial part, so the subhospital triangle is here. It pierces through the atlanto-hospital membrane and enters through the coronal mantle. That is the cranial part. And that is the one which we are going to focus on. The cranial part, it runs anteromedially through the foramen magnum in front of the medulla. The medulla, as you know, runs through the foramen magnum. The medulla is running through the foramen magnum. So it runs anteromedially from both the sides in front of the medulla. It runs in front and it unites at the lower border of the pons, and it becomes the basilar artery. Again, the site of union of the two vertebral arteries is a very common site of atherosclerosis. We will continue with the basilar artery just after I finish with the branches of the vertebral artery. So this is the, the components, the parts and the pores of the big vertebral artery. Branches of vertebral artery. We are concerned only with the cranial branches. We are not concerned with the branches in the neck. The vertebral part does not have any branches. Some of the part also does not have any significant branches. So this is the portion which has already entered the cranial cavity. And you can see it is running anteromedially in front of the medulla. This is the medulla. And it unites at the lower part of the border of the pons to form the basilla. So let's focus on the branches of the vertebral artery in the cranial part. First, it gives rise to the two posterior spinal arteries is not clearly seen in this picture. Two posterior spinal arteries, they run in relation to the dorsal root of the spinal cord. They remain independent and they run down. You'll see it in great detail at the end of this chapter. It also gives rise to two anterior spinal arteries, which you can see here. It gives rise to the two anterior spinal arteries. These two anterior spinal arteries, they unite. And they form a single anterior spinal artery, and it runs in anterior median fissure of the spinal cord. 
And we will see this also in great detail in the end of this chapter. Third branch. All of you know this very well. We have talked about it several times. Can you see this big branch coming out here? This long one. Who will name this for me? This is the pika. Posterior, inferior, cerebellar artery. This supplies abdomen implies posterior inferior part of the cerebellum and it also supplies the lateral part of the medulla. And we have already seen occlusion of the speaker produces what is known as the Hitt syndrome. Lateral, yes, Wallenberg syndrome or lateral medullary syndrome. We will repeat all those syndromes again. So this is the pika. Next, what is not shown here, the vertebral artery gives us to numerous unnamed medullary branches. These medullary branches are subdivided into paramedian branches and circumferential branches. Wonderful. Many of you recall. These are also important because they produce both the medial medullary syndrome as well as the lateral medullary syndrome. They are the unnamed medullary branches. And finally, it also gives rise to a few meningeal branches which supplies the meninges of the posterior cranial muscle. The same point is mentioned in your meninges chapter also, just in one line. So we will not talk about that. So these are the important branches of the vertebral artery, the cranial part. Again, I'm telling you, when you're reading them, please take a good hard look at the blue portions and do take special note of them. Now let's come to the basal artery. We have already seen the two vertebral arteries uniting at the lower border of the palms to form the basal artery. So let's take the course of the basal artery. The basal artery runs in front of the palms. Yeah. It runs like this. So remember, the vertebral arteries ran anteromedially in front of the medulla, united to form the basal artery. And the basilar runs in front of the pons, anterior to the pons. In an actual situation, the, the skull is somewhat like this. So the, the pons is resting on this sloping bone here. This sloping bone is the clivus of the occipital bone. So the basilar artery is situated between the pons and the clivus. The basilar artery runs between the pons and the clivus. On the anterior surface of the pons, there's a shallow groove. That's called the basilar groove. So it runs in the basilar groove. Now you know that that basilar groove is filled with CSF and that is called the pontine cistern. I mentioned it yesterday. So the basilar artery runs in the pontine cistern, in anterior to the pons, between the pons and the clients. And at the upper end of the pons, in the region of the midbrain, it divides into its two terminal branches, the PCs. So this is the course and the relation of the basilar artery. Now let's take the branches of the basal artery. All, all of them are granddaddy branches. Each branch has got a syndrome associated with it. And all of you know the syndromes. Yes. So just before you move on, I was definitely to my head around it. So I'm going to apply one that then is now directly adhered to the pine. The pine is directly adhered to all the brain surfaces, yes. Okay. And then we've got the basal artery that runs on that, and then we've got the rhabdoid exact circle of all of them. Exactly. And that's the system. That's the system. So as you know, the subarachnoid cistern is between the adenoid and the pyra. It has a sub-CSF space. So it is running between the two. All the blood vessels are in the subarachnoid space. So here it is called the subarachnoid cistern, called the pontine cistern. You're right, it's running between the pyra and the adenoid. Absolutely. Okay. So let's see the branches. And all of the branches produce syndromes and we know the syndromes. So it will be a repetition for you. Let's start with the lowermost branch. The first branch. The branches we count from below up. One, two, three, four, five. The first branch of the basal artery is this one. This is lateral view. This is the BCA. The AICA, anterior inferior cerebellar artery. So that's the anterior inferior part of the cerebellum. The previous one was PIC. This is the AICA, anterior inferior cerebellar artery, and it also supplies the lateral part of the nose. And we have seen the occlusion of this produces. Lateral inferior pontine syndrome. Next, just after that, now please follow me very closely. I know if you're paying very close attention, but here there are so many clinical correlations that I, I have to go step by step. 
just that after that, the second branch which is coming out is a very small branch. It's called the labyrinthine artery. Labyrinthine. The labyrinthine. What does this do? It's transferred by the internal artery meters and supplies by the internal artery. Between the AICA and the labyrinthine artery, can you see one cranial nerve emerging? What is the cranial nerve? CN6 is emerging. CN6 can be compressed by aneurysm of the AICA. CN6 is compressed by aneurysm of the AICA. Let's continue with our story. When the pulse is running in the pontine cistern, this portion, this portion, it gives us to numerous unnamed branches. You can see all of them here. It gives us to numerous unnamed branches. These are known as the paramedian pontine branches. These are also penetrating enough. They all penetrate into the substance of the pons. And they supply the medial most part of the pons. And occlusion of them produces, yes, complete the sentence. Okay, CN6 fine. Which syndrome? Medial pontine syndrome. And because it's running right in the midline, so it produces medial pontine syndrome. CN6 is involved, true, but I want the name of the syndrome. Medial pontine syndrome and the Infarction produced by these are known as lacunar infarcts again because they are all penetrating end arteries. You start getting used to these words, lacunar infarcts, because tomorrow we are going to talk about them in great detail. I will show you pictures also of lacunar. So these are the paramedian pontine branches which supply the what they produce? Middle pontine syndrome. Then, just in the upper part of the pons, it gives us to the second last branch. SC, superior cerebellar artery, the superior cerebellar artery. This supplies the upper part of the surface of the cerebellum and also supplies the latter part of the pons. Occlusion of this will produce again lateral superior pontine syndrome. It produces lateral superior pontine syndrome. To continue with the story, to take a good hand look at this, the SCA runs very close to this nerve here. What is the name of this nerve? This one, it runs, up, it runs very close to the action nerve. Sometimes a redundant loop of this SCA can compress on the sensory division of the trigeminal nerve. The lateral one is the sensory division, the larger one. And it can produce a syndrome. What is the name of that syndrome? It produces trigeminal neuralgia. So this is how it produces. It runs very close to the trigeminal nerve. So we have already seen two clinical correlations of this SCA. Finally, the, at the lower level of the, the midbrain, the PCA divided the facial artery divides into two terminal divisions, the PC. And the alpha over the PCA in great detail is after this. So between the second last branch SC and the last branch PCA, again you can see an artery with a nerve coming out. What nerve is that? CN3. Okay, you can have aneurysm of the PCA. That take the breast CN3. So this is again an important relationship. So we have seen the branches of the basilar artery and its relationships and all those okay. Now, before we come to the PCA and its distribution, let me tell you the blood supply rule of the brain stem. This is again going to be two slides, are going to be repetition of what we have already seen in block two, but I'm going to repeat it again for you. Take a look at these pictures. The rule is written here, the picture is shown here. This is a random section of pons at three different levels. The same principle applies to the medulla, the same principle applies to the midbrain. This medial portion colored violet is the, the, the paramedian branches. Okay, I'm going ahead of myself, sorry. Let me go step by step. Rule number one. The artery for the medulla is the vertebral artery. Artery for the pons is the basilar artery. Artery for the midbrain is complete the sentence. The PC. That's rule number one. PC also supplies the cortex, which we shall see just after this. PC supplies the occipital lobe. Yes, we know that. But it also supplies the midbrain because it is a branch in the front in the region of the midbrain. The PC supplies the midbrain also, it supplies the cortex also. Yeah? So please get this point clear. That therefore, the PC occlusions will produce both 
membrane syndromes and it will produce cortical syndrome first. So this point should be clear in everybody's mind. Okay. So that's rule number one. Rule number two. Each of these arteries, vertebral, one time and basilar, and PCA, they give rise to a series of named branches and a series of unnamed branches. The named branches we have already seen. We have just mentioned them. What about the unnamed branches? The unnamed branches are again divided into two sets. A series of branches which are given off immediately in the midline, near the midline. They are called the paramedial branches. And it gives out a series of long branches which go all around the brain cell. They are called the circumferential branches. Some of them are short, some of them are long. That is rule number two. The paramedial branches, they supply the medial part of the brain stem, respectively, med medulla, pons, midbrain. The circumferential branches, the long, short circumferential and the long circumferential, the short, long, short, long. They supply the ventrolateral and the dorsolateral parts of the brain stem, as can be seen in those color coded pictures. So, what is the significance of this supply? The significance of this supply is the paramedial branches, which supply the medial part of the brain stem. They contain mostly the finish the sentence. They contain they supply mostly the motor structures. Mostly I say. There are with the exceptions. Mostly motor structures. While the circumferential branches, the short and the long circumferential branches, they supply the ventrolateral and the dorsolateral parts, they supply the mostly the sensory structures. This is the point of the And finally, occlusion of these medial paramedial branches will produce all the medial syndromes. Medial medullary syndrome, apart from the named branches, which we have already finished, even these will produce the same syndromes. The medial medullary syndrome, the medial contact syndrome, medial midbrain syndrome. While occlusion of the long branches, the, sorry, the circumferential branches will produce the lateral syndromes. The lateral medullary syndrome, the lateral contact syndrome, and there is no lateral midbrain syndrome, but there is a paramedial midbrain. So, we have, so occlusion of the named branches will also produce syndromes, but occlusion of these unnamed branches will also produce the same syndromes. Are we clear? This is the rule of the blood supply of the brain stem. And it's all summarized in rule number one, two, three, four. I've written these rules so that you can remember them with these pictures. Now let's see the rest of the PCA. Let me finish this PCA and then we take our break. The rest of the PCA, after it has supplied the midbrain, it's supplied the midbrain by means of the paramedial branches and the circumferential branches. We are done with it. The rest of the PCA, I'll tell you the course of the PCA because that's very important for us, and I'll tell you the distribution of the branches. The course of the PCA. Take a good hard look at the same picture which you are familiar with. This is a section of the midbrain, yes or no? You can see the aqueduct of Silvius, you can see the cross cerebrae and the cerebral pinnacles there. This is where the PCA started from. It started from the level of the midbrain, if you remember, as a terminal division of the basilar artery. It winds around the cerebral pinnacle like this. This is the cerebral pinnacle, and you can see it is winding around. It is shown in this picture also. This is again an important picture. It winds around the cerebral pinnacle like this, from front to back. And this is again a very common sight of two things, both atherosclerosis as well as aneurysm. The bifurcation of the basal artery into two PCA is the site of aneurysm, and this curving around of the PCA is a site of atherosclerosis. So why are these sites of atherosclerosis? I'll tell you tomorrow. So this is a common site of atherosclerosis. And once it winds around, it is joined. Can you see this artery joining it? We already dealt with it in our first slide here. What was that? The PCOM. So again, the portion of the PCA proximal to it and the portion of the PCA distal to it has got two different segments. The portion proximal. Uh, now you have understood which is proximal, isn't it? Proximal is the one which started from and the distal to after that. Proximal part is called P1, and the distal part is called P2. Why? Same reason. If you have occlusion of the P1, there won't be any problems because P common compensate. If there's an occlusion of the P2, then we will have problems because there will be no compensation. And then it supply central and cortical branches. Let's take the cortical branches. 
as determined by six of the remainder of the cortex. These are the cortical supplies. Again, we will not memorize these names. I have written them just for your fun. It supplies the entire occipital lobe, both medial surface and lateral surface. This is the dividing line. This is the parietal occipital sulcus, which all of you know very well. This is the parietal occipital sulcus. Up to here was supplied the ACA, if you remember. So this supplies the parietal occipital branch, the calcarine branch, and the temporal branch. It supplies the entire occipital lobe, both medial surface and lateral surface. It supplies the entire medial surface of the temporal lobe. Cortex, I'm talking about the cortical branches, mind you. But, 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 please follow me here. It does not supply the temporal pole. It does not supply the tip of the temporal pole. The temporal pole. Because that is supplied by MC. Coming to the lateral surface, it supplies the inferior temporal gyrus, which was not supplied by MC. It's not shown in this picture, it's shown in a previous picture. So these are the cortical supplies of, it also supplies the hippocampus, by means of the hippocampal artery. So remember, PCA supplies the visual area, it supplies the memory area. It supplies the hippocampus, so these are the cortical supplies of PCA. Coming to the central branches of PCA, okay? Central branches of PCA are these branches. Can you see the PCA here? These branches which are coming out, and these are the Posterior medial central cooperating branches. So, how many central cooperating branches have we seen till now? Anterior medial central cooperating from the ACA, anterior lateral central cooperating, which was from the MCA, which produces the lenticulostriate arteries of cerebral hemorrhage, and the posterior medial central cooperating. These perforate again through the brain substance, through another region of the brain, which is called the posterior perforated substance. Posterior perforated substance is in the cerebral pinal uh, intrapinal ground fossa. And they enter the brain at right angles. They are also penetrating branches. They are end arteries. That's why they are called perforating end arteries. And they give rise to several branches, these central branches. And some of them are important for us. One, splenial artery. It supplies the posterior one fifth of the corpus callosum. Very important to remember. Two, it gives rise to the posterior thalamoperforating, which you cannot see here. And we have already seen this artery in our chapter on thalamus. It supplies the posterior part of the thalamus and it produces occlusion of this ischemic or hemorrhagic function of this produces. Can anybody tell me? Do we remember the thalamic pain syndrome? Did you hear in Lucy syndrome? It is produced by occlusion of this posterior thalamoperforating. The word perforating should click a bell in your mind. It is a perforating branch, end artery. It can get occluded. It can produce ischemic hemorrhage, ischemic infarction or hemorrhage infarction. And it produces thalamic pain syndrome. Next, you can see in this branch, it supplies choroidal branches. Posterior lateral choroidal and posterior medial choroidal. Posterior lateral choroidal branches, they supply the choroid plexus of the lateral ventricle, and posterior medial choroidal branches supply the choroid plexus of the third. This is again, I mentioned this in the chapter on the ventricle subarachnoid. The choroid plexus of the lateral ventricle is supplied by both anterior choroidal as well as posterior choroidal. Posterior choroidal comes from PCA, anterior choroidal comes from internal choroidal. And the third ventricle is supplied by posterior choroidal only from the PCA. So these are the important central branches of PCA. And finally, this is again a summary slide. You can see in this picture, by this color coding, the areas of supply of PCA, the areas of supply of MCA, and the areas of supply of PCA, both on the lateral surface of the brain, as well as the medial surface of the brain. Medial surface of the brain, medial surface of the brain, lateral surface of the brain. Do form a good visual image of the cortical surface.